Hey everyone, how are you guys tonight? Welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we talk with people from all walks of the publishing industry. I'm Christy Stratus, author of the Dark Victoriana Collection, and Lurking for Legends is a live interactive broadcast and we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or simply make comments on what you hear during our discussion. So tonight we have Canadian poet Alexandria Goodall. Welcome, Alexandria. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. It is awesome to have you. And before we get started, I'm just going to point out that unfortunately my awesome co-host Richard H. Stevens is not here tonight because he's taking care of his sick cat. So we can all just send him some, him and his family, some love and some positivity. I'm sure he could use it right now. That is tough stuff. I just went through it too. So, you know, I really, really hope it comes out okay for him. So anyway, let's move on. Can you just introduce yourself to us, Alexandria? Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, for sure. So I am 22. I work as a nurse primarily, and I do writing on the side. I publish two poetry books, and I kind of just balance a little bit of both. But writing is my passion, and I've always wanted to pursue it. So I'm really happy that I got to publish and do that on the side. So I think your first book was published in 2020, and the second one in 2021. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so my first one was published right when COVID actually hit. And then I wrote my second one throughout all of COVID. We had a lot of time, so I just got it done. <laughs> Absolutely. So then what, since you said that writing is a passion, what stoked that passion to be able to publish this poetry in 2020? Yeah, so I started writing Rise in High School, and that's when my first book kind of came to be. And I just started reading to teachers and uh, friends and primarily my mother and they all encouraged me to make it something more um, I never really liked English or anything I never took in college or in high school it wasn't really a passion of mine but I started doing it as more of a therapy for myself with mental health and it just turned into something I didn't even know it was turning into until it was done and before I knew it was published that is fantastic. I I love hearing about people who have this passion and it sort of at some point sort of bubbles up, I guess you could say, and it gets to this point where you're like, this is it, I'm going to publish it, you know, and that's sounds kind of like, you know, it, it took from high school to now and now you're, you know, you're published author, you've got two books out there, actually. So tell us a little bit about each of those books. Yeah, so my first book, um, I definitely suit towards young teens. I was in high school when I wrote it, and I always write about what's going on in my life. So in high school, it's about different relationships, where it's friendships, working with your parents, living at home, um, going through mental health, um, as we all do in high school, and going through that. And my second book was written in 2020. Uh, for me, I was going through a breakup at the time, and with COVID, you have so much time to process all these emotions that are coming at you, whether it's from a breakup or you know, losing a job or being isolated, you have so much time. And it just was this year of just constant writing every day. And it just came out of me and in my second book. Yeah. And when you mention uh, mental health, you are actually a nurse practitioner full time. Um, so, you know, probably, I don't know if you wrote about this just from the perspective of, you know, emotionally, or if you wrote from it, it from the perspective of anything, you know, that you've learned as a nurse, um, you know, tell us a little bit about that, like the mental health aspect of any, either of your books or both yeah. of them. Yeah, for sure. Um, so going through high school for me, I think it was a lot about learning how to communicate and just talk as a person in high school. You know, when you're going through that phase, you have your friends, but I don't think you're really, you're still trying to figure out yourself. And until you're honest with yourself, I think you boggle up a lot of things and you're not able to speak your mind. And for me, at that point in my life, writing was my way to speak my mind. And it was my therapy. For me, I was just going through a lot of um, being trapped in friendships or just not knowing where my life was going and feeling isolated, anxious, and a little bit depressed. And my writing definitely helped me through that. And I had friends who would come up to me after and read my pieces and they'd be crying their eyes out because it just brought something out of them. And it was really cool to see the reaction and that just kind of encouraged me, even though I was scared to share it at the time when I was in high school, to bring that forward and share my writing with everybody. Yeah, that is fantastic. And J.D. Estrada, who is a fellow poet, says that's awesome and writing is definitely cathartic. 
Absolutely. So do you find like, what would you say is your process? Do you find like sometimes you may may write in like an emotional state and then go back and edit it? Or do you usually find that like when you're in that emotional state, you end up keeping a lot of what you've written? I do keep a lot of what I write. Usually I'll be in the middle of something and say, okay, everyone go away. I need to write right now and get it all out. And I will go back and edit through a little bit of it. I find if more if I'm editing, it's because I'm self criticizing my own thoughts or going back and thinking, oh, should I really been feeling that way when I wrote it? But it is a raw emotion. And that's the great thing about writing is you're allowed to be as true to yourself as you want to be because it's there on the page for forever and you should keep it that way. So I try to not edit as much as I can uh, and keep being true to the content that I put down in that moment, which is really cool about writing. Absolutely. And uh, Robert Kano is saying, I can't survive without writing. So I get it. Absolutely. You're talking to the right people, Robert. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and JD also says, and awesome to be prolific during these times. That must have given you a sense of accomplishment during a really tough time. Oh, yeah, for sure. Whether it was COVID, I think we all just wanted to have something certain or something that we could put out for the world to see that we are still, I don't know, moving on or just COVID feels there's so many unknowns and to have something out there that solidified and says, hey, we all made it through this. For me, it was my writing. And just to have that and look back on for forever is such a cool experience that I'll always have. That is, yeah, that's that's really something. It's it's, you know, this is kind of just a silly little aside, but um, where you're saying something that you can always look back at and something that you always have, mm -hmm. you know, some people of course choose to journal, um, which may not be publishable, but um, I actually had a director that journaled every day of his life and saved every single journal for his kids and gave them this pile of journals <laughs> it's like oh wow thanks for all these journals you know what you're doing is you know maybe you end up keeping some of them maybe something you write is super personal and you decide not to publish it but like so much of what you write with something like poetry is very shareable and i think that that is so fantastic and as you said people can really relate so do you find I, I don't know if you've um, gotten the chance to speak to many of your readers, but do you find that like teens tend to relate more or adults are both to your books? Um, I'd say both. I've had coworkers in my retirement home that have, I donated the book and some of my residents actually read the book. Um, I actually have one resident right now. He's 90 and he's writing his own book about his life. It's called 90 Freaking Years. And he read <laughs> my book and he absolutely loved it. I don't know if it was because of our personal connection or because of the content, but I would say it's definitely geared towards 20 or younger, um, but it can relate to anyone. I mean, COVID or mental health can spread so far and a piece can just connect with someone in a way that you never thought it would when you're writing it. And it's just a really cool process to have that. I've had a lot of teams that reach out to me, if anything. That's so nice. And it must be really rewarding to hear that your words are you know, really hitting home in a positive way. I love that uh, about your resident. Um, when I'm sure that you inspired him with your writing as well to make him feel more comfortable writing his own story. I told him the second that book comes out, he's like, well, it's not really anything exciting. Like no one's actually going to read it. I'm like, no, I'm so excited. You need to sign my copy. It's just, I think it's so inspiring to see someone who's 90 still following his dreams and publishing a book at that he's never published before. And it's just so cool to see that you can follow your dreams no matter what age you are, which is really interesting. That is such a great point. There is really nothing to stop you. It's fantastic. Absolutely. So we have JD is asking, so two down, what's next for Alexandria and mainly poetry or going to branch out? And do you like short poems or go, bro or, uh, go for broke? Let's start with what's next for you. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Um, for me, I think I did so much creative process in such a short time for my second book that now I just kind of want to focus on living true to, because with poetry, it's very uh, reflectory and you reflect on a lot of your words and see, okay, what do, why did I write this and where do I want to go from there? So for me, it's kind of living that person that I wanted myself to be when I wrote that book. Um, so yeah, for now, I just kind of want to enjoy life. And I am definitely going to write more books. I think my books for me will be just kind of a short series of my life with poetry, which will be great to look back on. Again, like that guy who wrote all those journals for his family, but in a different way that's more approachable and understandable for, you know, a wider range of readers. Um, 
I would love to do a book launch party next year since COVID is opening up slightly because when my first book was published, there was no form of any personal contact. I couldn't do a launch for that. And then my second book came out during COVID as well. And it's just kind of been, I haven't done any readings in person yet. I've been trying to reach out with social media and do different, you know, initiatives to get people excited with my book, but it's not the same as being there in person. Like you said, for poetry readings, it's just so much fun to interact with the audience and to have that would be really great for next year. Definitely. And I, I definitely want to come back to your Facebook readings as well. But uh, let's just, uh, I just want to finish up JD's questions. And mainly poetry or going to branch out. Do you think you'd ever write like a novel or anything like that? Part of me kind of wants to write a novel, but I just don't know what genre I would do, how comfortable I would be with that writing. And I've never been exposed to that version of writing or been taught anything about it. I think poetry is a little easier to branch out in a way that you don't have as much background knowledge on it versus a novel. Uh, but I think it'd be so interesting. Even my boyfriend that I was joking about writing different stories about my residents and making a book out of it. But you just, I don't know, it would be a very different type of writing style for me. It might be something down the line where you really feel the pull toward it, like poetry. You never know. You never know what could happen. Yeah. yeah. So, and he, his final question is, do you like short poems or go for broke? Like long poems, short poems? Um, mine are always a paragraph or two. I'm definitely like to condense things. I feel like for myself, I can get more meaning if I try and get it into a small amount. If not, I'll just blurb off and keep talking about something that really, I just want the words to hit home when you read it and then that be it. Uh, so I do like writing short poems. And that is a bit of a writing challenge as well. I don't know if you're, you know, trying to, you know, challenge yourself in that way, but it is a challenge you, trying to fit so much into a short um, space and choose the right words and all that. It, it is, it's a tricky thing. And people use that for, you know, practicing good writing in general. So, you know, that's kind of a, a good way to do it too. put it in poetry form. Pretty cool. No, exactly. Yeah, it must be very different for you and your writing style. Because how long are your books typically when you write them? Yeah, they they end up. I don't make them too long. I'm looking at like um, fifty five thousand words, sixty thousand words. It's like upwards of, between two and uh, three hundred pages. You know, so you know that. Not as long as others. Richard is currently working on a hundred thousand word novel. He is almost past that point. He's actually writing it longer than that. I think his last one was longer than that. So that that is something that to me is intimidating, but he loves yeah. it. Oh wow. <laughs> So let's see. We also have um, Margaret, who is another fellow author. She writes historical fiction. And she says, maybe the distilling into a poem simplifies the process. What do you think? Is it more sort of a complex process or do you consider it simple? I think I can consider it simple because it just comes right out of me. It does because it's such that raw emotion that it just automatically comes out. It feels so natural to me, which is why I love poetry. It just Mm -hmm. oozes out of you and you don't even know what's happening until it's over and you're reading and you think, oh, I just hope other people can relate to this. And you know, when you share it with other people that you just see their reactions and you know that it's going to hit home for certain people, whatever the piece may be. And it's just a great feeling. But I would say for me, it just does come naturally and very simple in that sense. Which is fantastic. You know, some people strive to write poetry and struggle with it. So it's, uh, it's great that for you, this is just the natural way you do it. That's really cool. Yeah. Margaret is currently at 88,000 words in the editing phase. <laughs> She's beating both of us out by a long shot. <laughs> oh, wow. Robert asks, what made you decide to publish your poetry? I have found that poets are a tricky lot <laughs> with some who refuse to publish entirely. That's a great point, Robert. Yeah, it's so true because poetry is so raw and it's such a personal Thing, that when you put it out there you're putting out who you are to the world and it's very intimidating uh, but I think you just have to look past it and see that you're going to be doing for something for somebody else and they're going to read that and say okay I'm not alone I'm not the only one that's feeling this so it's completely worth it in the end even though it's definitely something that at first I didn't never thought I'd be able to publish or even speak about it with people so it's definitely intimidating but well worth it in the end. It's Absolutely. very freeing for yourself as an individual to just have it out there and know that, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the words may be, it's out there and 
it feels good. It's very freeing. Mm, definitely. Uh, I noticed that uh, one of the reviews on your first book, So This Is Life, um, said that these are poetic questions to get you thinking. So is that something that you like thought about when you're putting it out there? I want to make people think and that's kind of what my goal is or did that just happen along the way? Yeah, so my first book, I had a really hard time coming up with a title and because it's very broad. Poetry is actually my first book because um, it talks about, you know, when you're a teenager, you're thinking about all these things like different views on the world and politics and culture and where you fit in with everything. And then you think about mental health. And there's so many things you're thinking about at your stage of your life. So it was very broad and difficult for me to come up with something. And then I thought, so this is like dot, dot, dot. And at the end of my book, I say, I'm so young and I don't really even know what I'm talking about. And I think that maybe when you looked at this book, you thought you would learn all the answers to life, but really we don't know the answers. And that's why the dot, dot, dot to kind of leave it as a mystery. So there's definitely a lot of thought evoking uh, pieces in both of my books, but definitely in my first one and what I want this series to continue on with that, even though we have all these questions and we have to be thinking about things, is there really an answer to life and do we need to go out searching it or just to live our life? And that's kind of my main general idea for my book and um, as a series and that's kind of it just ended up working out naturally that way but when I came to the title that was kind of my background behind that yeah. that is really cool I always love hearing how people come up with their titles it's always so interesting it's a hard yeah, thing to do it is it really is it's like half the battle right <laughs> so and the design process and getting all that in place is such a difficult thing because you think that's what's going to catch your reader's eye and it has to completely um, display what your book's about. And it's a very intimidating, pro but it's super cool process and it's super exciting once it is done because you get to see how it all is. I can have a book done and still be trying to work on the title, work on the title. What is the title? <laughs> you know, it just goes on and on. So yeah, yeah I know how that is for sure. So, uh, Margaret says, yes, who is crazy enough to choose chapter, chapter titles too? <laughs> I know, it's true. Some books have chapter titles as well. And yeah, I often think that as well. That must be a whole other way of thinking, you know, coming up with those things. Right, Because and when I uh, was writing, I didn't really have an idea if I was gonna do chapters or not. And I ended up doing chapters. I ended up giving titles for all of them, but it was such a hard job to, categorize all the poems into different sections about what work with what and then to give it all a title it's a really hard thing to do absolutely definitely so uh i noticed that you're a lot of poetry a lot of poetry even the poetry in barnes and noble um you pick up and it's like very very skinny you know there's a, a small amount of pages and of course the poet has put a lot of work into, you know, making sure it comes across right and that the emotions they're trying, the, the ideas they're trying to share in that short, small space come across, uh, you know, properly, but also there's the rhythm of it. And, you know, there's so much to poetry, really. There can be, it depends on, you know, how you decide to go about it. But your books are much longer. Your books are 189 pages and 200 pages, I believe. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I mean, that is a lot of poetry. Um, is that kind of like, would you say, uh, how, I guess, how how long does it take you to write that much poetry? Let's say with your second book, since your first one was in high school, with your second book. And, you know, what did it ever occur to you to publish like multiple small books? Or were you just like, no, this is all part of one work. And that's how it's going to be. Yeah, for me, it was kind of like it was all part of one story. Because, for example, my second book was primarily about COVID and me experiencing a breakup through COVID. And for me, breaking up those stories into smaller stories, I just wanted to be one thing. It's kind of like a, you know, um, a real chapter, you know, fiction book where you're reading through the whole thing and you get to experience all of it in one bit. And I wanted that to be the same experience for my book, even though it is poetry based. So it did end up being a lot longer. Um, that book, though, I think I had most of it written within six or seven months. And then uh, the editing process was a lot shorter because I was a little bit more of an experienced writer versus my first one. Uh, but the editing process always takes a while, a couple, maybe four or five months by the time I got it out. But yeah, I just 
like to have it all together. And when I know that there's a story, I want to start from finish to, yet, to end. And it felt just right doing it in a longer series for my poetry. Yeah. And for those who don't write poetry, but enjoy reading it, um, you know, when we talk about editing poetry, some people might be thinking, how do you go about that? Like, what is your process? Are you looking at just the word choice? Are you looking at like, how? what exactly are you doing when you're editing? Poetry is, you know, when you write a, you know, a series like, or something like your book, you're, you're writing the story. So you know, where the plot's kind of going in your head. But for poetry, because it's so based on emotion and in the moment, I would write the entire book uh, and not organize it according to flow. And then I go back because I want to keep the emotion in order. But then when you go back and you realize flow and how it all fits into the next piece and the next piece, you have to reorganize everything. And it's such a lengthy process, but it's really worth it and satisfying in the end when you see how it all comes together. And also, like you said, picking out words that are going to have meaning and impact for those short paragraph pieces versus something that's a little bit longer. Quite a yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. How everything flows together. That is such a good point. And now that you say that, I have heard um, some other poets talk about how you end up like taking it all apart and putting it back together. And, you know, it's almost like a puzzle trying to figure out how it fits the right way. Yeah, definitely. So, um, excuse me. Uh, I noticed one thing uh, on Instagram that I wanted to bring up with you, and that is that there is a hashtag. When I was looking up hashtags for how I wanted to promote our chat tonight, um, I came yeah. across the hashtag poetry is not dead. And, um, you know, that kind of immediately brings to mind, like, do people think it's dead? <laughs> you know, and of course, Maybe some people out there think that it's a, a less popular form, maybe not, but that hashtag has over 6 million posts, right? So that's a lot, you know, a lot of people trying to share that idea that poetry is very much alive. So I, I just kind of wondered what your thoughts on that are, the idea that like poetry could be either antiquated or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that people associate poetry with earlier times in a different type of language but now I think we're seeing poetry being reinvented in this new uh, in the 20th century and it's really cool to see how people are making it relatable in a different way versus I think people maybe used to associate poetry with this very uh, knowledgeable thing that you had to self-critique and or think back to Shakespeare and school or just very different that those forms of writing where it's very difficult to analyze and really understand what the writer is saying but now I think poetry is being reinvented again where you can associate it with something that's going on in your life or you're able to understand the words a little bit better relate it better or that's just you know it's moving with the times but I think poetry is very much alive and it should continue to be <laughs> Absolutely. I agree 100% with you. And there are things that sometimes, you know, emotions that you take away from poetry that you may not get out of a different kind of writing. It's just how it comes across. Yeah. yeah. So you do um, Facebook reading. Uh, Facebook, you read your poetry on Facebook. We'll see if I can get that right. <laughs> so you do that. And I don't remember if that was live or if it's pre recorded. But, uh, well, first of all, is it live or pre recorded? Uh, so it's pre-recorded. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. And I always love seeing people's readings and you get more of the author's interpretation from it. So um, first of all, what inspired you to do that? And everyone stay tuned because we're going to have Alexandria read a couple of her poems. So, but tell me what inspired you to do that to begin with. Yeah. So I, again, when I published my books, it was both during COVID. I was trying to find different ways to market my book without being in person and readings online is a huge, huge way to do that. And when I published my first book, I didn't really do as much. I was doing different forms like giveaways or baskets, but it just, I wasn't able to connect with people as much. So I really was excited with this reading series. I started this summer actually, and it's called the summer we split and it's a whole series on um, my book. And I do one reading from each chapter every week and I uh, link a song to it. So by the end of the readings, you have a breakup playlist. Um, but yeah, I just want to, I've been trying to find different creative ways to get my book out there uh, during COVID. And that was just a great way to do it and to get me comfortable with reading for when things are back open so I can do more poetry readings will be really cool. But in the meantime, it's been working out great. 
Nice. And this is kind of a good practice as well, like getting used to reading your stuff. It can be weird, right? <laughs> oh, definitely so weird. <laughs> so I'm just going to read a couple of comments and then we'll get right into your reading. I'm excited for that. Margaret says, well, Percy Shelley can still surprise you in the context of a modern novel. <laughs> And then Anita Stewart says, uh, there's a lot of niche poetry these days as well, like horror poetry and sci-fi poetry. And I believe Anita Stewart has a book of, po of uh, horror haikus out, which I own. And that is really cool stuff. Very, very different. Really enjoy it. So let's segue straight into reading from your, your poetry. So tell us uh, the book it's from and take it away. Sounds good. So I'm going to read for my new book for both the readings. Um... I will start with one that I think can kind of relate to everyone with COVID, uh, but it is associated with my breakup, but just kind of how we all go a little stir crazy sometimes. Okay. I fall into a deep slumber. I retreat into a hibernation state. I cave into a person I am not. I collect my nuts and store them in my trunk, preparing myself as would a squirrel for the harsh winter yet to come. But unlike this creature, I do not go nuts for nuts. Rather, the nuts make me nuts. I fill myself full, so full with nuts that my treehouse overflows. I set out in search of a cave, as would a bear, before the snow settles in, searching for a place to sleep the cold away. Protected from the brisk breeze by the walls of my newfound home, unlike a grizzly, I do not shy away from the below zero conditions. I need the forest to hear my roar 365 days of the year. I want to be wild and free all season, any season. I have this calling within me to be wild and free. Love it. Very much enjoyed that. And I love your allusions to nature. Those are great. Do you include a lot of that in your book? Uh, I'll just do a, I've linked things to metaphors on I think I had this one about an old lady that was doing a puzzle and related it to life I just do I pull from different things in my life that I see and I make it into something that people can understand I find sometimes that's easier than going completely raw into the emotion because that's almost overwhelming for people when they read it sometimes and then this gives them an opportunity to see how their life relates to it in a different way than maybe I wrote it for or intended it to be but it still allows me to start thinking um, especially with yeah. the mental health pieces that I wrote and I find that you have to kind of open it up for them but really at the end of the day your own um, journey through mental health or a breakup is going to be your own so to kind of get a trickle into that and then think about it further for yourself is a way that i like to write mm. which is why i like relating to things like nature or whatever it may be yeah yeah and i love that uh that whole thing about for sort of like a forced hibernation that you don't really want to be in you want to be out you want to be wild for free you know i really appreciated that and i think you know i think that that is on so many levels of course as you said you know covid with the lockdowns and all kinds of stuff like that but also you know when you're going through something no matter what it is sometimes you end up being at home because you have to or you need to or whatever and you don't necessarily want to be so i really i got that i really like that a lot. Good. So let's hear your second poem then. Okay. This one is definitely COVID related. Um, but it just kind of, this was one of my last pieces and I wanted to relate uh, COVID to what my personal experiences were and how, although it was a really hard year, uh, sometimes the hardest times are what make you into the person you are today. And I really like this piece for that. So I'll go ahead and get started. December 22nd. Pfizer finds its way to my local hospital. December 23rd, the first 15 percentile of my coworkers are vaccinated against the coronavirus, yours truly included. Although we stand six feet apart, we unite as one against the global pandemic of the century. But the fight is far from over. One out of 15 find themselves in the emergency room, and in the months to come, more guinea pigs will fall, creating yet another victim to the virus. January 14th. Dose number two will come knocking on my door as it penetrates the skin of its humble abode, leading me to wonder if the odds will be in my favor this time round. Will the mRNAs fulfill their duty as I have in my role as a nurse? And although this answer has yet to present itself, I have faith in the antibodies in my body. My immune system is my newfound religion, leading me to believe in science's ability to telecommunicate with my cells through Morse code. 
And although my name will go down in history as one of the many first to receive the injection, this year was never truly about the coronavirus for me. My 2020 defies that of COVID-19 because vaccine or no vaccine, 2020 was the only cure I'll ever need. So that is really fantastic. The, very um, different sort of format with the dates and it feels almost like a diary in a way, you know, which, uh, which I like. That's really cool. So I guess, did you write that in stages as you were going through all of that? Or did you just sort of one day say, I'm going to write down the dates and, you know, it's going to be part of how this is going to work. I had written down the specific dates just because I knew it was kind of cool that I was one of the first, you know, as a nurse getting that done it was just a really cool experience. We had a picture of all of us and we posted on our work thing. And, um, but for me, I was more trying to find a way to kind of look back on the year without focusing on the breakup and more about different dates that also to acknowledge coronavirus for what it was and to show that, um, whether, you know, whatever your experience was, we all survived it. And now we're able to move on from it and learn so much and grow as a person. And no matter what COVID had to say about 2020, it was our 2020. And we were able to own it and move past it and grow as individuals in a society because of it. Which is really I really like that line. Um, I think it was, uh, my immune system is my new religion. I thought that was really clever and it makes so much sense also because um, so many people have not necessarily paid attention to their immune systems until something like this hits. And then suddenly it's like, whoa, we really need to focus on building ourselves up and staying strong and all that kind of stuff. I really, I thought that was a great line in particular. Obviously we can see how, you know, um, your job being a nurse, um, has impacted some of your poetry. What about, th this may be like kind of an odd question, but I often like to find out how a job impacts, you know, your writing, obviously like the, the topic lends itself. Um, but aside from that, or maybe in addition to it, is there anything about nursing that sort of ends up in your writing somehow? There probably isn't a whole lot of writing going on during nursing that would contribute to your writing, but you know. Um. For me, especially because so, so I work in long-term care specifically, and I love my residents because of connections, the different stories that they have to share. And for me, I'll get little tidbits of advice from them over time. And their advice, I find compared to others, is just so profound. And you know it has meaning to it because of all the things that they've been through. And we all have experiences, but when you're working with that type of population, that age group, it's so neat to see a whole lifetime of experiences coming into one sentence of advice. And being able to absorb that as a nurse is just a really cool experience. And I'm able to apply it to a lot of my writing, which is great. Um, yeah, so I do get a lot of it. Not necessarily, a lot of it is pulled from my personal life, but I do find that working as a nurse brings a whole different element to it. I never thought I would get out of it and get to be able to put my writing, which is really cool. That is really cool. And, uh, you know, once again, I, I like how you phrase that about um, an entire lifetime, of, uh, you know, of advice in a sentence. <laughs> You're being poetic without even meaning to. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, you know, so far, it seems like, you know, we have a, a couple of particular topics that you've mentioned you know, between mental health and uh, COVID and um, breakup related things and stuff like that. Is there any topic um, in particular that like grabs your attention and it says like, I have to be written as poetry or is there anything, you know, even any topic that's automatically like, no, I can't write that in poetry form. Are there, is there anything like that? Um, hmm, I'm trying to think. I definitely gravitate towards relationships with other people and with yourself. I find that that's a huge part of everyone's life. I think a lot of us don't always tap into that part of ourselves. And I think it's really important to share that. Um, for me, I would say I don't like to tap into a lot of controversial topics with my poetry, because I feel like poetry, poetry is meant to be a welcoming environment where you're allowed to have your own thoughts. And it's meant to provoke things versus trying to turn someone off and say, Oh, I don't really agree with that. So I don't want to read this. It's supposed to be a welcoming environment where you're able to think your own thoughts from what you're reading. So I definitely avoid controversial topics for the most part, just because I do like to, to be open and for people to feel like they're in a safe space to either read that or to express it from the after they're done uh, with their reading. Sure. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I appreciate that. 
So JD says, um, does the empathy of nursing translate into empathy in your writing? That's a great question. That is a very good question. And it definitely does. You see how small things affect a person um, when you see someone who's, you know, in their 90s and their health is completely gone and they just have lost their independence and you feel for that person and you think how other people feel in the world, whether whatever it may be that they've lost, whether it's their own mental health state or whatever they may be going through in life, you have to realize that everyone's a person no matter what, um, how they may portray themselves. And we have to be respectful of that and allow them to feel welcome in a space uh, by reading or, you know, having a discussion like you and I are where you can be open to speak your mind, but also not feel like you're judged. And I think my nursing in that perspective definitely relates into my writing. Yeah, and that is wonderful to hear. That is really cool. And it's so cool that you were able to, I think you said earlier that you were able to um, put your poetry somewhere in the place where you work, something like that. Is that just for fellow nurses or, or also for patients? Uh, so it was actually in the resident library. So I just left it there for them if they want to pick it up. And it's currently out. So someone is reading. I don't know who, but <laughs> yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. And I know that earlier um, you had mentioned how it will be great, like when we're able to get back to things like book signings more often and stuff um, and that you'd like to do stuff like that. So, you know, in your ideal setting, like what would you like to do? Would you like to do this, like some readings and then some signings and like maybe it would be in a bookshop or like a coffee place? Like what in your mind, what, is it, what do you kind of like picture as the first thing you're going to do? I would definitely do uh, interesting coffee shops. So when I traveled, I've done a lot of traveling in Europe and some by myself. And whenever I would be writing, especially my when I did my first book, I did three months of traveling by myself for a good chunk of it. And I went to all the coolest coffee shops. That was my goal every day was to find one different coffee shop. I ended up going to uh, the coffee shop that JK Rowling wrote her books at and sat there for a good two hours. I got the perfect seat. The lineup was completely just out to the street and I ended up being the last spot. And it was just one of those moments like, okay, she might've been sitting here and I'm going to make something happen. It was just, I, it was a really cool experience and to do it at different coffee shops and have that experience again, of kind of hunting for cool spots would be really cool to uh, experience with my readings. I love that. And I know a lot of our, uh, the people watching will relate to well because we have a lot of coffee lovers of course uh, who are writers so you know to me that sounds like a dream you know traveling around trying to find the perfect coffee shop that's fantastic by the way do you have like a, a specific um, place that you like the best whether it's a one place or even like a country that you like best um i love ireland definitely um i'm trying to think that was not where the jk rowling was unfortunately um, but there's this one little cafe that I found and they made homemade knitted cozy things that go around the little teapots and it was just the most adorable place in the world and it was overlooking this field. Everything's green in Ireland. The people are amazing. I love them. I experienced there, but I would definitely go back and we could do a little drive around the island, maybe do a little book for you. So there you go. <laughs> That sounds fantastic. Boy, would I love to go there too. <laughs> that just sounds ideal. So is your traveling uh, reflected at all in your poetry books? Um, definitely. So I um, have traveled. So that trip specifically, I went to Ireland and did a work away. So you uh, work at a specific location and you get free food and stay. And I did an animal sanctuary for my first ones. And I met just people from all different walks of life. I think that's why travel is so important, especially for younger people to experience yourself in a setting where it's just you and you're kind of reinventing yourself in an atmosphere where there's no influential factors from previous uh, life back at home. And you just get to experience yourself in this whole new way with a group of strangers in a, a place that's well, first time really find a safe place to go do this on your own. Um, but I really encourage it. And as a writer, I was able to learn so much about myself and the world around me that I didn't even see at home. And I just love having that experience with writing. So it definitely had a huge influence on my books. Yeah, that is great. We have a couple of questions down here and then we will wrap it up. So JD asks, what would you say to people who say they don't like poetry? You're lying for yourself. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, Perfect. Um, Maybe 
I don't know if poetry, sometimes it makes people uncomfortable because it's so raw. And I think if you're not maybe ready to accept that for yourself or you're just not open to it yet. And that's, you know, everyone's at different stages, but I think that's where a lot of people maybe have that side of poetry that they're not always as open to. Um, yeah, it's definitely maybe a lot of comfort in yourself or that's just not your genre and that's okay too. Yeah. Absolutely. So we have David Kelly who's asking, do you find that some people will interpret your poetry in ways that you really don't understand? What is the oddest? Oddest? I'm trying to think of my oddest experience. I don't even know if I can think of one that was out there. But yeah, people, I'll be, they'll be reading it and start crying or having a weird or laughing or having a really odd reaction. Actually, one girl we started laughing at my one piece. And I remember it was such a raw emotion for me. And that was one of my pieces that I always nitpicked and said, I don't even know if I want to put that in there because it just felt so raw to me. And for her, I think she was still processing something and she started laughing. And she said, I feel this, but I don't know if I want to feel it right now. And she was just almost uncomfortable with the whole idea and kind of bringing it back to how, you know, some people just don't like poetry because they feel uncomfortable almost when they read it. That's absolutely true. It's, you know, that since you say that, that reminds me of when somebody reads a novel and something inside themselves that they've experienced is, is very raw and it's hard for them to get through the novel. You know, it's similar to what you're saying. So yeah, what a strange reaction. And then, you know, and that's the, that happens to be the one piece that you were nitpicking. Of course it had to be right. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> and we actually have one more and that's from Keegan. What does literary success look like to you? Literary success. For me, although, you know, having all those books out there is going to be a great accomplishment. It's going to be super exciting to be published. For me, literary success is being able to connect with people and let them get something out of the writing that you're doing. Because at the end of the day, you can, you know, be a successful writer and be making all this money, which is great and would be the dream. But really, for me, the dream is just to allow people to connect with my writing and even if I can just touch one person's life that's very success to me I love that that is the perfect note to end on I'm so glad that we could have you here thank you so much for being here tell everyone where they can find you after the show okay I will send it out and share it to everybody but yes uh, I have a website called so this is life uh, you can find me with alexandria.goodall on Facebook and Instagram and you can keep following along in my uh, summer series and my readings and uh, take a look at my book. Excellent. And for those who don't know, Alexandria is in Canada. So it's so this is life.ca. It's at the top of the comments. So you can grab it there as well. Might even be in the posts. <laughs> so again, thank you so much for being here. This has been absolutely fabulous. I loved talking to you. <laughs> So next week, uh, we are going to have a fantasy panel, and I am super excited for that one. We're going to have four guests and then, of course, our two hosts. So, um, you know, since I've been writing historical fantasy, I can finally consider myself a bit of a fantasy author. Very exciting. <laughs> so I really can't wait to do that. And Richard will probably be back for that. I am so looking forward to it. Of course, it's at... It's on Tuesday as always at 8 p.m. Eastern time. I hope you guys will tune in. We'll be posting that shortly. And again, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for all your great questions. This was fantastic. I really appreciate it. And we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.